Any questions? No, I think we're How long are we going for? How long does this generally go? Uh, as long as we think it's good. And as soon okay. as we think it turns to crap, we'll say thank you and <laughs> goodbye. Hi, I'm Chuck Braverman. This is another episode of Westock Online. Um, today we have a, another film that is a, an extraordinary doc feature film that um, I actually saw because it's eligible and in the running for a potential major award this year. I don't want to jinx it and say what it is, but you can take a guess. You'll know what it is. And uh, I jumped out of my seat after I saw this film because it's, in my personal opinion, going to be one of the major contender contenders this year. Um, and we're going to get to it in just a minute with the filmmakers. Um, but I want to just remind you, we're brought to you in part by Real Screen. Real Screen Summit's coming up in Austin, January 23rd to the 26th. It's for filmmakers, buyers, sellers, cameramen, sound men, producers, editors, musicians, wannabes, superstars. They're all there. You should be there if you're in the nonfiction documentary business. It's really great. Um, today's film is, today's episode of West Talk is about the new documentary film, Wildcat. And the filmmakers are Melissa Lesh and Trevor Frost. Hello, Melissa. How are you? And Trevor. Hi. Hi, Chuck. Good morning. Hi, Chuck. Good Great morning. Where are you guys uh, sp speaking to me from on your iPhone? We are currently in a hotel in Los Angeles, the, the urban jungle of L.A. The urban jungle of L.A. Um, your film really grabbed me, I got to say. It's, uh, it's an amazing accomplishment. And first of all, I just want to congratulate you and say it's, it, it's a spectacular, emotional, educational, entertaining, um, wonderful experience that I'm, I can't wait until this is out in the public and everybody is going to get a chance to see it. And um, let's take a look at the trailer first. I love you. I'm in this most beautiful place in the world and I can't be happy. When I was in Afghanistan, I was medically discharged with PTSD. I felt that life wasn't worth living. And maybe I should just go when no one knows if I'm alive, no one knows if I'm dead. And then I met Sam. That's when my life really took a turn. This is Keanu, our awesome lot rescue. He will be reintroduced into the wild in a year and a half. I didn't know if it was going to be doable. Their alternative is living a life in the zoo or dying in a much worse way. This is your new home. Don't give up. Don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to teach you how to become a killer. Amazon tree boa. This is the snake. This project with Keanu, it's like his redemption. He's saving me and I'm saving him. This is one of the most dangerous environments in the world. That's a wandering spider. Keanu, I know it still hurts. It's really difficult working in an unprotected area. <sighs> you okay? <laughs> you scared me. <laughs> Don't follow me. Now he knows where Harry lives. I'm worried that he can't live by himself. He caught his first rodent. He caught his first rodent. I love you. This is not good. I've seen the jungle change people. I feel like I've done something good. But it's 
hard to let go of something you love. But it's now or never. We're wild animals, me and you, we're wild. So this film is about a young British soldier who's back from the war in Afghanistan, and he has some depression and PTSD, and he gets a second chance in the Amazon jungle when he actually meets a scientist who happens to, to be a beautiful young woman, and together they foster a orphaned baby ocelot. Uh, how did this film come about? It's a, it was a serendipitous beginning. I was a still photographer predominantly before making this film. And I worked mostly for National Geographic uh, magazine. And I was trying to figure out what my next story for the magazine was going to be. And I was in the Amazon, the Peruvian Amazon, looking for anacondas, which are the largest snake on earth. And as luck would have it, I wasn't finding any. And, and I still don't really know why. Uh, I was expecting to find several anacondas every week, uh, which sounds terrifying probably to most people, but, but uh, you know, I was really excited to find them. So anyway, I, I, because I wasn't finding any anacondas, I was spending a lot of time in this hotel sort of re-strategizing. How are we going to change our plans to hopefully find more of them? Uh, I was with a team of scientists, local and international scientists, that, that were trying to study them. And sitting in this hotel one day, and Harry Turner, you know, who's one of our main characters, he walks by me, and he's obviously quite striking because he's covered in tattoos. And a friend of mine that was working with me on the Anaconda Project leans over and he said, you see that young man that just walked by with all the tattoos? You'll never believe his story. And, you know, you hear that a lot, uh, and usually it doesn't pan out. And, and so a few days later, I, I actually got to meet Harry, and I got to meet Samantha, uh, who is, you know, was his, his partner at the time and also is an extraordinary conservationist and scientist. And they, when I met them, they brought with them a hard drive, and, and they plugged this hard drive into my computer and started showing me videos that they had filmed of themselves uh, rescuing wildlife and, and rehabilitating wildlife with, you know, basically no resources at the time. And I was struck immediately by two things, the quality of the cinematography and also the, the, the moments that they chose to, to keep recording. Um, and that's something that, you know, when things get difficult, people usually stop recording. People usually put the camera down when, when the, you know, they're just doing it themselves. And I just couldn't believe that they had filmed through some of these really difficult moments. And I, and I was so blown away that I immediately called Melissa on a satellite phone that I had and told her, I, I said, you know, I, I think I've got a, a film that will, you know, be, it's, it's just a story that we've, we've got it. We've got to drop everything and turn our attention to this. And, and that's, that's how it kind of, uh, well, the rest is history, as they say. And how long ago was that story? You met Harry and Samantha in 2018, summer yeah. of 2018, and we began production that fall. So he came back home. We, we don't live in L.A. We live in Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. And we were back in Virginia um, and, you know, thinking basically that we were going to create a short film out of this archive that they showed him, <laughs> this little drive. Um, and there was an ocelot that they, you know, attempted to reintroduce in this footage, and it was stunning. And so our idea was, you know, let's go down there, let's conduct some master interviews, and we can stitch together maybe a short film. And it was about a month later that we got a call from Samantha on, on her satellite phone from, from the middle of the Peruvian Amazon saying, uh, you know, we just rescued another cat. And so at that point, we realized we can follow this in real time. This is going to be a much longer journey. And um, so that was the first the first of 13 trips that we, we ended up doing and uh, each spending almost 200 days in the in the Amazon. So uh, from Virginia, where do you fly from D.C. to Lima or what's the what's the route? And then from Lima, I'm assuming and then from Lima, how far is it? I mean, how long does it take you to get from your home in Virginia to the lean-to in two days? 
two days. Yeah, it was about two days. I mean, the, the, the flights depended, you know, where you kind of connected through depended on what airline you were on. And the fir for the first year of production, you know, we actually were using airline miles that I had accrued over the last 15 years of, of international <laughs> travel to get down there. And so we were taking whatever flight you could get. And often, you know, when you book with airline miles, the, uh, the layovers are brutal. So we were kind of just taking whatever flight we could get to get down there. And then you know, once you would get to Lima, it was about an, it was another hour long flight over the Andes into the rainforest. And and then from there, it was a three hour car ride and then about a one hour boat ride to where Harry and Samantha um, have their sort of uh, had their sort of conservation station that they were that they were building. And then a hike. The, the lower research station was about an hour long hike. And you see Samantha in the film hiking this trail that we had to go in every day or every time we went in. And it's mud and you're slipping and you know camera gears going everywhere um so it was always so, a hassle <laughs> yeah so considering the not just the distance but the physical hiking part and all that can i what kind of gear did you bring in because it was just the two of you coming in or i mean i assume yeah. you didn't drive in any 40-foot trucks with grips and gaffers and just you know, what did you bring us. in and <laughs> yeah, and we had to keep it quite lean, you know. I mean, we kept it lean for multiple reasons, I think, out of necessity and because that's how you navigate these, you know, pretty gentle. So what what is lean? How, lean? What exactly? We each had a camera. We didn't have a sound person. Um, I had a C300, so it was a little bit of a bigger, you know, rig, but we were often shooting on 5Ds or C100s, just come in with, you know, a couple cameras and our phones, really. We filmed we, a lot of it on our cell phones in the, in the we, beginning. Yeah, I mean, we filmed with whatever camera we, we had available. I mean, there is a, a decent amount of footage in the film that's actually shot on, on iPhones. Um, so really? It was shot wow, on can't. GoPros. Um, you know, and, and I think for us, and, and we actually filmed it all in 1080 because, you know, the, the resources that it would take to film a film like this in, in 4K were just, were, were too large for us at the time. And, and also you're dealing with, when you're dealing with 4K, you're dealing with, with massive amounts of, of data and, and battery, you know, you need the, the energy. And so when you don't have electricity, how do you, how do you power out the computers and, and the batteries when you're shooting 4K, obviously it consumes all that energy a lot more. So there were challenges like that. And, and so we, you know, we felt that even though we were filming in 1080 and, you know, all the streamers don't want 1080 anymore, we felt that, you know, the story carried its own weight well enough that, that hopefully people would, you know, would want it and um, would help us, you know, get the film out to the, the rest of the world. And, and so far that's turned out to be, um, to be the case. So the three, you know what the three most important things are in a documentary, don't you? story story and story right <laughs> and um and it just reminded me what you're you're talking about 1080 <laughs> there was a picture the other day of a press release picture of alexandra pelosi the the daughter of pelosi of senator pelosi mm -hmm. filming her mother and there you know hbo is announcing their new film and it's it's alexandra walking backwards and in her left hand is this mini tape or whatever it was little mini camera you know that you know maybe wasn't even 10 1080 and i love the fact you know when you read if you go down the wormhole and i see it all over the internet you know netflix has announced their new uh the cameras that qualify in 4k and 8k and 12k and you know and everybody is and here you have this film and i watched the film the other night and I'm shocked to, to not shocked, but I'm really surprised that some of it is is iPhone because it's it's first of all it's amazingly uh, well produced and beautiful, and the fact that um, you you took on part, your Samantha and uh, and Harry as sort of partners in producing this film, the footage with the with the ocelot was exclusively shot by them where the ocelot is and and i must say um, in in theory that sounds like a terrible idea to to include you know the subjects of a film as the camera people and producers doing the important stuff but it is totally seamless and beautiful and uh you know half some of the time i'm thinking like how did he film this where's the camera person you know except when he's running and holding the camera but it it just on every level the sound quality was really great and i noticed you in the in the notes 
there's there's a, a line that said you had ambisonic microphones. I don't know. I've been in the business 50 years. I, what's an ambisonic microphones that were deployed on the site to capture? You know, that I can speak very, very briefly about it, but our really, that's a question for our sound designer, Lawrence Everson. He actually went to the Amazon. So the whole film was filmed on camera. You know, we had lav mics as much as we could. We had, you know, Zooms recording ambient noise in the rainforest, but it was nothing like kind of a, a full, you know, home Atmos uh, audio soundscape. So Lawrence, our sound designer, went down after, you know, post and or during post and recorded an incredible full spectrum, you know, rainforest soundscape. And Ambisonic, as far as I understand, is basically like eight directional microphones. And so you can pick up an entire 360 degree soundscape. And he was, I mean, he was having a total field day. And there, he sent us in a, a whole report after he came back. And it was exactly when he was waking up and the kind of, you know, sound layers that he was after and the bird species that he was learning about. And he had a complete field day and came back with some incredible audio that, you know, we had the joy of working with him and stitching it together into the edit and, and making it quite seamless. Cause we wanted, we still wanted that raw quality. Like you feel, you know, not over designed, you feel like you're there, you feel like you're with them, but uh, one of the main goals of this film, and you know, we can talk about the themes and things, is was really to immerse people in this environment and not just understand the power of nature and its healing potential, but also feel it. And when you hear those noises and you're surrounded by this incredibly rich ecosystem, that does something to our brains. And how can we create a soundscape that is so immersive that you feel like you just spent the last, you know, hour and 45 minutes in the rainforest and and experiencing some of the the effects of that um and so the sound the soundscape was something we're really excited about and you should be because it's really great and the other thing is i have this as a filmmaker i have this terrible habit of you know looking for shadows and reflections in car windows and you know on films and stuff like that and the other my one of my other pet peeves on low budget films is seeing mics and filmmakers that are too lazy to take the wire and to put it down and hide the lob. I don't think I saw a lob mic in the whole thing anywhere or a, or a, ba a body pack, you know, a backpack. So everything was well hidden. And because to me, if when you have a lob mic right on the front or a dangling wire, it kind of takes you out of the, the picture, you know, sometimes. And uh, so on a technical level, on a story level, on an emotional level, it's, it's uh, an amazing it's just an absolutely stunning film. And what was it like for you guys sort of parachuting in to this environment? How long did it, does it take you to, I don't know, do you ever really assimilate, adjust? I mean, are you, are you spraying yourself with anti-bug spray? Or, are you, you know, what, what's it, what was it like for you being down there? I mean, it was really special. You know, I, Melissa and I have both been drawn to wild places, to nature, you know, uh, all our lives. And that was cer certainly something that brought us together. You know, we've, we've been together as a, as a couple and also working together for eight years now. And, and one of the things that, that drew us together initially was our love for nature and wildlife and wild places. And so um, we've always been, because we've always been drawn to these places, we've always looked for stories in these places. And, and, um, and one of the things that I've found over the years in traveling to, to, to all these, you know, remarkable wild spots on the earth is that you find when you go there there's not obviously many people but the people that are there are all very like-minded and they're usually there for a reason and you when you when you communicate with these people you obviously have you just immediately kind of identify on on a, on a sort of level without even talking um because you, you know there's just not too many people that go to these these remote spots on the earth right like they're they're hard to get to and they can be difficult environments to survive in and, and so there is a communion that exists between everybody that goes to these places. And so for us, it was just an absolute joy to be able to spend time in a place as remarkable and, and as alive as the Amazon rainforest. And certainly, you know, the first few days when you would get there were, were hard um, because you were coming from air conditioning or, you know, you're coming from the comforts of your home. Uh, but what, what happens is, and, and this is true for everyone, is that you, you do, you really quickly acclimate to the environment. 
you, your body adjusts, you begin going to bed, and when, when it gets dark, you begin waking up when it gets light. Um, and what, what you actually find is that you, you kind of almost become like truly human, if that makes sense. Because when you leave society and, 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 and you disconnect from the rest of the world, you, you, you shed all the stuff that society has sort of taught you and society has kind of made you think that you need to behave in certain ways or do things certain ways. And I don't know, it's a, it's a, really, it's a really special experience. And I think that, um, you know, one of our hopes, obviously, is that, you know, people can watch a film like this and they can, they can understand that from, the, you know, from watching this film. And obviously not everybody has the privilege to, to, to travel to some of these places. And so, you know, I, we feel a certain obligation to make sure that if we, we have that privilege, um, that we, we communicate how special a place like the Amazon rainforest is. And it makes you very present too. I think it's, it's important to add, you know, when we go to these places and when Owen Wave had just started, which it had when, during, you know, the production of this film, it was just- That's popular. Samantha's uh, nonprofit that she started. Yeah. Yep, Owen Wave is, is the nonprofit that is doing the animal rescue and, and rehabilitation. Um, when you go there at the time, you know, there was no Wi Fi, there's no cell service, you're completely off grid. And um, I think what that does, and at first your mind is thinking, oh, you know, did I pay that bill or oh, did I send that email? And, and if, you know, we would go for two, three, potentially even four weeks at a time. And so it was, a little bit like okay is my life gonna maintain you know at home or did I am I did I forget something and, and so there's some anxiety once you once you're on that it's actually a logging road that we um, go in on and once you're on that road and the cell cuts out it's like okay you know did I forget something what you know what am I gonna mess up at home and then you start letting that go and yeah I think this around the same time around day one or day two you start letting all of that go and you realize none of that matters. You know, that email that I sent, it's okay, or didn't send, it's okay. Like we're here right now, we're in this incredibly rich environment and we're with people that we love and, you know, we care deeply about. And so I think when you start shedding all of that stuff too, it makes you really present and you're really with the people that you're with, you know, it's not like, going to Thanksgiving and everyone's on their phone and no one's really engaging, you, you, you don't have a choice because no one has any kind of escape or, or, you know, alternative to walk away and close their door or just tune out, you know, you're there, you're present. Um, and so that, that is also a really binding force. And when you're in nature, when you're that remote, and I think it's why we were able to make the film we made was because we had this rainforest to thank in a way for kind of creating you know this space of real connection and intimacy um and it's it's really refreshing because i don't think you know we we often get that a lot in our kind of busy modern world what did you miss the most when you were there probably cold drinks uh i miss our cats <laughs> I, I actually was not a, a cat person at all before making this film. In fact, I really rather despised cats. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Melissa was always, you know, saying, hey, we should get a cat. You know, we should get a cat. We should get a cat. And so then we start making this film. And about eight months into making this film, uh, somehow I decided, you know, hey, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to adopting a cat. Next thing I know, we have three cats <laughs> living at our house uh, and we, that we adopted from the local shelter in Richmond. And so for me, every time I was away, you know, during production, it was, uh, I found myself missing them and wondering what they were up to. So. What would you say, you know, when I'm teaching documentaries and I ask, I show a film to students and I say to them, what's this film about? And, you know, to, to, to younger students might say, oh, this is a film about a guy raising an ocelot. And I'd say, no, that's not what the film is about. And so I'm, yes, a guy is raising an ocelot, but what, what is the film about, in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's multifaceted. Um, you know, when we started this story, we, we always were thinking about the healing power of nature, and that was the big driving force and the idea that we wanted to explore like Trevor mentioned, you know, our whole lives we've been drawn to wild places and animals and 
and why is that? What is what is that about? You know, what is the power of 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 that of that connection and and these wild places? So that was kind of the idea. And of course, with Harry, it was so clear that this wild environment had a big role in his current being alive. Um, you know, and he was very outward about that, that he went to the Amazon essentially to disappear and to take his life, um, to make it look like an accident. And once he got there, it was transformative and he felt the beauty again in the world and that maybe life was worth living. And so when you hear that, you know, it's, it's powerful and you think, what's that about? You know, what's going on here and how can we explore that? And to varying degrees, you know, and I think even for us, there's there's so much interesting, you know, science out there about even just a walk in the park and how our brain chemistry changes when we, you know, look at a tree um, or spend time with an animal. So there were kind of these I driving ideas from the beginning. But I think, you know, that transformed as as things do when you make films and and you learn and you explore and grow and it, it morphs. And I think what it morphed into was more, more kind of an exploration of, of trauma um, or the things that we struggle with and how, how those things shape us, make us who we are, and ultimately allow us to do the things that we are able to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, Hemingway, it was famous for being asked all the time, you know, what what this book was about, right? Like when he wrote The Old Man and the Sea, I, I remember there was a, an article that I read somewhere about how all these reporters were pestering him about, about what, what, the, what the book was really about. And his answer was always the same. He was like, it's just about a, you know, it's just like I wrote a story about a guy that goes fishing and his fish gets eaten by a shark, right? And he's out at sea with the, you know, uh, with, with this, with the, just himself and his boat, and and, and all the fish that he, that he catches get eaten by sharks, and and everyone's trying to figure out what is the you know symbolism in it and everything else, and it always drove him crazy because he said, I just want people to take away from it what they what they will, um, and everybody ultimately will will take away something different from 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 a film. I think um, certainly some films have more entry points than others, and I think one of the one of the strengths with this film. Um, is that there are a number of entry points for people. Um, and, you know, adding to what Melissa was saying, you know, one of the things that, that like, personally that, that I took away from the process of making this film um, is that, like, I, I struggle with depression and anxiety for, for 10 years now. And before making this film, I really only viewed it as something that was negative, you know, something that I wanted to go away. And if someone presented me with a pill that I could take and it would magically make it disappear, I, I would have done it. And through the process of making this film and spending time with Harry and Samantha um, and seeing what, what they were doing, the work that they were doing, the dedication that they had to, to the work and to, to saving animals, I began to really start to look at my own depression and anxiety differently. And I started to ask myself, you know, are there, it, does it perhaps allow me to see the world differently? And, and is there a strength in that? And um, and so now I actually you know I, I, obviously there's days where where uh, I, I don't I'm not doing very well and my depression is more of a struggle and so sometimes you know sometimes there are bad days but but I do look at my depression and anxiety now not just as a negative but sometimes like what are the positives of it you know it, it has it, a, it allowed me to be somebody that feels more deeply um, to, to to think about things differently and interestingly I was just having a, a conversation with Ira Wool who won uh, Best Feature Documentary for a film many, 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 many decades ago called Best Boy. And he was mentioning to me another film called Let Me Be Me. And it's about a family embracing their son's I, autism. I know the film very well. I've seen the film. It's quite good. Let's make it happen. Most of the time, you're trying to let go and just join him. For lots of other people, what we were doing was pretty weird. Then you see him just look at you. That's different. But then one day, he just woke up and he was like, Let's go. Hi, my name is Kyle. <laughs> and I, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm planning on watching it ASAP. And I, and I, and I understand that what, what the family does basically is they, rather than, you know, rather than kind of trying to make this young man with autism assimilate into our world, they actually went into his world. And in doing so, it sort of opened up this this entire um, new way of, of, of being, right, um, with, with this person that has autism. 
and now he's a successful fashion designer. And I think so often in our world, we, you know, we look at people uh, and we, we kind of identify them by something or we think about, uh, about some of their, their, the things that they struggle with or the challenges that they face as, as just uh, uh, something bad. And, and I think what's happening now is we're sh seeing a shift in the world where people are starting to say, hey, you know, maybe uh, autism is actually, uh, you know, it allows these people to see the world in a way that you can't even imagine. Um, and, and interestingly, that ties to something really important for both of us, and that is the way that we view the animal world as well. Because for so long, we've always, I think, devalued animals and, and thought of them as, as less intelligent than us. And um, when we do th talk about animal intelligence, we often compare their intelligence to ours. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, the, the, you know, the famous uh, astrophysicist, uh, he, you know, he, he was talking about animal intelligence and he said, isn't it, isn't it foolish that we measure animal, other animals' intelligence using human intelligence tests? And, and, I, and I love that, that idea because um, you know, our science still isn't able to kind of crack so many of the secrets of the animal world. And, and I think, you know, we're starting to now appreciate that there are animals out there that may actually be smarter than us in many ways, you know, more intelligent and more emotionally intelligent than us. Um, so, so that was a, you know, a major takeaway for me. And, um, and then when we brought on, you know, when we brought on other team members like Joshua Altman, who was an editor and a producer on the film and has worked on, you know, amazing films like Mining the Gap and, and Elvis and Amias, um, who is another producer on the film, they, they brought, you know, with them um, some of their own, obviously, takeaways from the film and, like, the, you know, themes of letting go. And, um, you know, whenever you love something, uh, you know, you're eventually going to have to let go of it, right? So when you have a child and they turn 18 and time for them to move out of the house or go to college or, you know, they, they grow up, you are letting go of them in a certain way. And we see that theme in this film. And so they, as parents, were bringing things to the table that, that we obviously didn't necessarily see. And, and, you know, that's really one of the great joys of filmmaking is, is having a, a, a team is that, you know, everybody is able to see something differently and, and, and make sure that those threads are highlighted in the film. The quality of this film, and by the way, the, the music score is wonderful and certainly adds to the, the picture and the emotion of the film. But it brings to mind, I'm curious about how much you can speak about the, what the budget is of the film, roughly, or whatever terms you're comfortable with, and, but, and also the details of the funding, because obviously you didn't go down there to shoot this film initially, or you, didn't, you, you thought it was going to be a short. <laughs> what was the process of funding and, and getting to where you are now? Yeah, it was a long process. Um, like Trevor mentioned, you know, we started on basically just shoestring no, uh, nothing. Um, we flew down on frequent flyer miles. We put everything on credit cards. I think back and I was like, how foolish were we? <laughs> the chances of us never being able to pay those off were very, very high. So, um, you know, thank God it did work out. But it was basically, you know, a year and a half of production. Uh, started in 2018. And we actually didn't bring on our first kind of financing partner, uh, who's also our sales agent, until 2020. Um, Who was so that? 30 West. Yeah, so so we had two very small uh, equity partners at the beginning, and they were really, um, one was a, a friend of Samantha, and uh, he's incredible. He's now, you know, one of our dear friends and, and EPs on the film, Steve Hall. Um, and we had, yeah, basically two very small kind of equity partners that just got us through the few trip, you know, the trips that we needed to to get enough material to really start to to get some larger support. Um, and then basically, tw fall of 2020, so two years later, we brought on 30 West, um, and you know, we were turned down by what seven different places yeah. before we got it, you know, brought it to them. Networks and, or streamers no, or funders? This was, this was going to be an, a larger equity partner. And uh, we were also looking for an agent for sales. So with 30 West, they do both, um, which was, you know, great. But it was, yeah, it was the kind of um, thing where you just, you don't think anyone's going to want it because, you know, we keep getting turned down and turned out. And when you, when you talk to seven different places and everyone says, nope, pass, nope, pass, no pass, it's, 
a little disheartening. And when we got on the phone with with uh, Trevor Groth, who's also our EP on the film, and uh, was an incredible you know lead program at Sundance for 26 years, he looked at us and he said, "I get it." You know, we were going to pitch him, and he was just like, "You don't need to tell me. Like, I get it. Tell you know how do we how do we sign basically?" Um, so it was. Yeah, it was it was it was powerful to have someone like that believe. And then, that. so then, uh, and what was the pro? When did it get to and, Amazon? Yeah, so then fast forward a year. So we continued to edit during that year. We had a you know basically production was wrapped. We did a couple more pickup shoots, um, but basically because we had that kind of fuel now in the tank, we could go full time into the edit. Um, we did bring on two other editors. We worked um, also with David Thief, who's a very talented editor, and Ben Gold, um, both in New York. David Thief's just outside of New York and in, in near Pleasantville. Um, so we were able to really kind of start assembling a rough cut, basically. Um, and Josh and I, you know, were also full full on in the edit. And um, at that point, we could, you know, show enough material to pitch to streamers. And so when we about a year later, so fall of 2021, you know, we all felt, okay, we've got the material we need now. Um, and we sent the teaser and, you know, a collection of scenes and, um, and, you know, Amazon, we got the, in, we, we piqued the interest of, of several distributors um, at that point. So that's when we knew, you know, we can, we can, because actually we didn't have our full budget funded at that point. It was basically just pieces. Um, and so it was just an, it was just keeping enough in the tank to get to the point we needed to hopefully get a pre-sale. So did they fund the, the whole project at that point or the yes. portion? Yeah. And did they the participate in an editorial say way and say you, you can't do this or you should do this or that, or did they stay out? They were extremely wonderful to work with in the creative process. Yeah, we, we worked with um, their two creative executives, um, Scott Foundas and Alex Pennebaker, and uh, it was an incredible creative process. They gave us, I would say full, they gave us full freedom. They gave us incredible notes. You know, we all helped refine it together to make it the most powerful, but it was, there was nothing that was kind of off limits or, and that was something we felt was really important with a distribution partner. You know, we wanted to make sure that whoever we worked with were gonna was gonna allow us to tell this story in the most true, powerful, and raw way. Um, and I think some distributors saw that, and you know, like Disney, you know, they're like, "This isn't this isn't for us." Not because it's not incredible, but because I don't think you could make the film you want to make if if we take it on. And this is going to be first in theaters for a short run. When? Yep, it'll uh, it'll be in theaters in the U.S. on December 21st, and it'll be in theaters in the U.K. on December 23rd, and then streaming on Amazon Prime on December 30th, worldwide. I think December 21st is the date that the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences announces their shortlist. I could be wrong on the date, but I'm pretty sure that's it. And I will make a prediction. I will be stunned if this film does not make the shortlist. Um, in my opinion, no. the, the problem is, of course, that this year, like every other year, you, you only have 143 other films that are competitors and doing everything that they can to make the short list. And that's an issue that you have to get the film out there. And I certainly hope that my fellow members of the Academy take a look at this film. It's, it's very overwhelming for, for members of... I think the motion, the, the doc branch, because you have so many films. And I'll say as a, as a, as a member, as a longtime member, we do get assigned randomly 10% of the titles. This wasn't one of the titles that I was assigned to. This is one of the titles that I'm just going through my list randomly. And, and what's this, you know, and I started watching it and couldn't turn it, you know, had to watch the whole thing. So, um, and, well, thank you for stumbling upon it. Well, <laughs> That's how it I, starts. I'm, I'm so, you know? I got so excited, you know, and, 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 you know, immediately, you know, wanted to make arrangements. And 
uh, to, 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 to do this show. So, but you never answered the question about the, to the, about the budget. Do you want to yeah, give me yeah. a, a ballpark idea? Of, I mean, I know yeah. that puts you on the spot and I don't want to put you on the spot, but to the degree that you're comfortable, do you want to say what sure. the area of the budget was? Is? Yeah, it was, it was around 1.7 million. Um, and so when, when Amazon came on as a partner, we were able to increase the budget. Um, you know, everyone agreed, 30 West agreed that it was important to increase the budget to make sure that we had what we needed to make, you know, the, the film as high quality as possible and um, that we had, you know, extra assistant editors because we had over a thousand, over a thousand hours of footage. So it was really important that we had, you know, assistant editors that were able to help us with some of the technical challenges. We, you know, we filmed on, I think, like probably seven different cameras. So there, there were, were a lot of technical challenges to overcome in the edit. Um, and then, you know, we had a, a, a two co-producers uh, and one of our co-producers, she was also an associate editor on the film. She actually quit her full-time job and, 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 and took a huge leap of faith and started working with us. And we were figuring out all sorts of different ways of paying her. We were in that at one point considering trying to let her move into our house uh, as <laughs> sort of a form of, a form of payment early on. Um, but, you know, she she actually is the only person that watched every single second of footage, um, you know, well over a thousand hours of footage. And she became such a critical uh, piece of the of the you know, of the puzzle. She was integral to the team and her name is Mallory Brack and she lives in, in Richmond, Virginia, where we're from. And I think that just underscores, um, you know, that, that these things really are, are made by a whole group of people. And I actually think, you know. Uh, personally speaking, I feel like too much credit is given to directors um, because, you know, they're, the, we, we, we just couldn't have done this without our team, you know. Um, can you tell me, well, two, I have two questions, and if I don't get them out, I'm going to forget them. But the first one is I'd love to hear a brief description of the editing. How do you, how do you cut down a thousand hours? And the other question has to do with the, what the Sundance grant meant and how, what, what you had to do for that or whatever. So let's talk about the editing first. Can you tell, tell me what the process yeah. was briefly? The process was very long. <laughs> um, we started, <laughs> I basically started editing. Um, so, you know, I've always edited my own work. I've been making short films for about a decade and taught myself how to edit and shoot. I didn't really understand what directing and producing was. I just knew what filming and editing, <laughs> those were the the two essentials of making a film that I understood. So that's how I always made my work. So from the beginning, you know, from 2018, when we first started production, I basically started using the material and cutting together small teasers. And I think the number of iterations that I edited that teaser for different grant applications and different pitch materials was probably over a hundred. It just, you know, now we need it three minutes, now we need it five minutes, now we need it six minutes. And so in the process of doing that, though, as we were getting more material and kept going back to the rainforest to film, it, it gave me a familiarity with the material and, you know, started that process. And it was right around that time as well, I think early 2019, that Mallory came on. Yeah, early, too. early 2019. So not long after we started production. Um, like we mentioned, our co-producer and associate editor Mallory Bracken came on and we started working with her to transcribe. So it was slow and, you know, every minute was transcribed. We didn't really know what we were doing. <laughs> we had never done this before. So we knew we wanted to log everything, but we didn't realize kind of what was reasonable for creating a footage log. And so what ended up happening was she went to such great lengths and did such a phenomenal job at this log that it ended up taking her four years to log all of our footage. And she logged every single clip by the time of day, who's in the shot, what they're wearing, what they're saying, the kind of, she rated the shot by the aesthetic and emotional one to five, uh, you know, the, the value. It was the, the type of shot, how wide, how tight. I mean, everything you could, imagine categorizing footage by she categorized it and it was it was the real work of art and melissa i understand you went to a very popular film school that a lot of people <laughs> have gone to yeah it's called youtube <laughs> so I, I did a whole episode you know with an, with another filmmaker matthew o'brien about you know is film school worth it? it wasn't the whole episode but a lot of it was is film school worth it and 
we talked about, you know, the, the cost and the debt and... and so I can tell uh, you a funny story if you want. Um, I didn't go to school for film. I went to school for fine art. So I went to school for painting. My undergrad is in painting and printmaking. Um, and I got quite disillusioned with the kind of fine art world and making, you know, squares for white boxes for rich people and, you know, it just, it never really felt like it was my way of, you know, telling the things and talking about things that I was interested in and, and the places that I was really drawn to. And, you know, Trevor and I started dating and it was right around that time that uh, we got, he got a grant with National Geographic to go to Australia and do a story on crocodiles. And, you know, I'll never forget the kind of decision-making process in my head of, okay, do we, do I go to school? Do I go to do this master's or you know, Trevor was saying, we can do this project together and we can go and live in Northern Australia and film crocodiles, you know? And it was just such a clear moment of, yeah, why am I going to go to school to do this when I could actually go out in the world and just do it, <laughs> you know? Well, here's a really unfair question, which I, I'll cut out if it's, if you don't want to answer it is, but did you pitch this to Nat Geo and did they pass on it? They wanted it. I mean, we can well, we can tell you the longer story and and what how much of this you decide to keep or maybe none of it, but we we pitched them in 2019, when we had basically a teaser and two scenes. Uh, this was before our full kind of edit package, and um, they turned it down. And at that point, we just wanted the budget, and I think our budget was like 600 or one point maybe 1 1.2, um, and they they turned it down. They weren't interested. Fast forward like, two years later, and they were, you know, in a bidding war with with uh, Amazon and Netflix, and they didn't get it. Can I put that in? <laughs> Is it okay if I put that in the show? In this... I mean, I, think... I don't know that we want to point out the fact that they they. We've, we've well, they like had the not... good. They had the good sense. They had the good sense of coming back and 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 bidding for it. I mean, they lost yeah. because. What I think what changed um, later on when when we eventually sold the film and, and National Geographic was interested in it is that, you know, we had uh, people that that you know had been in this in, been telling stories for a very long time and have been watching films for a very long time that helped us craft something that was very different um, and. And so, you know, Melissa had done a great job with the teaser and a, and a great job with the with the scenes that we presented to Nat Geo. But there's no doubt that when you have partners like Josh Altman and, and Alyssa Namias and, and then Trevor Groth, you know, Trevor Groth and, and Adriana Bonta were, were the two executives at 30 West that that were our creative partners there. And um, and like Amazon, they were they were so great and and and, and um, gave us latitude to to make the film that we wanted to make. And they didn't shy away from the hard material. You know, there was never any point where they were trying to make us make a Disney film. And and then what they did, and, and you know, this is obviously one of the things that dawns on you when you watch this process happen, is they, they are, I'll never forget this, they, they went through all the footage when, when we all decided that it was time to, to the sell it. The edit, not all the raw footage. Yeah, they went through all the, you know, edited, the edited scenes, scenes and the teaser, and, and they specifically picked out, you know, all of these little sections, you know, with, with exact time codes of what they wanted to present to all the different distributors. And it was so scientific, you know, it was, it was like they, they, they just really know what they're doing. Well, thank you guys very much for being a guest on Westock. And I can't wait to see what the reaction is the rest of the world to your fabulous film. Congrats. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, great, we're... great chatting with you.